Hello everyone, this is Doc Ina, and this lecture is on post-term pregnancy. This is the main reference for our lecture, Williams Obstetrics 24th edition, chapter 43, post-term pregnancy. To download this lecture deck for free, go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine, and you can also try to answer the quiz to test your understanding of the lecture. And please, don't forget to subscribe also in this YouTube channel. Poster pregnancy is a pregnancy that has reached 42 completed weeks, that's 294 days or more, from the first day of the last menstrual period. There are two categories of pregnancies that reach 42 completed weeks, either pregnancies that truly are 40 weeks past conception, or pregnancies of less advanced gestation but with inaccurately estimated gestational age. Here are some of the adverse pregnancy outcomes associated with post-term pregnancy. So Alexander and colleagues reviewed 56,317 consecutive singleton pregnancies delivered at at least 40 weeks age of gestation between 1988 and 1998 at Parkland Hospital. So as shown in this table, labor was induced in 35% of pregnancies completing 42 weeks. The rate of cesarean delivery for dystocia and fetal distress was also significantly increased at 42 weeks compared with earlier deliveries. And more infants of post-term pregnancies were admitted to intensive care units and had more neonatal seizures, stillbirth, and neonatal death. Post-maturity syndrome is one of those adverse fetal or neonatal consequences associated with post-term pregnancy. So we, here we have a neonate or a fetus with wrinkled, patchy, peeling skin, prominent in the palms and the soles, and this is said to be secondary to the loss of the protective effect of vernix casiosa. Also, the infant is open-eyed, unusually alert, and appears old and worried. In some cases, there is severe growth restriction. So why does this happen in a post-term pregnancy? The adverse consequences of post-term pregnancy is said to be due to placental senescence or placental insufficiency or what we call placental aging. Placental apoptosis is significantly increased at 41 to 42 completed weeks compared with that at 36 to 39 weeks. Pro-apoptotic genes such as kiss peptin were shown to be upregulated in post-term placentas. There is also decreased fetal oxygenation secondary to placental aging. There is also high incidence of oligohydramnios or decreased amniotic fluid in a post-term pregnancy. Low amniotic fluid volume plus passage of meconium will give rise to a thick, viscous, greenish am amniotic fluid which the fetus may aspirate and this is what we call meconium aspiration syndrome or MAS and this could possibly lead to intrauterine fetal death or neonatal morbidity such as prolonged nursery ICU stay and antibiotic treatment for neonatal sepsis. Decreased amniotic fluid volume can also result in cord compression which can result in decreased fetal oxygenation and manifest as fetal distress during electronic fetal monitoring. There is also increased incidence of fetal growth disorders in post-term pregnancy such as fetal growth restriction or fetal macrosomia. Stillbirths are more common among growth-restricted infants who were delivered after 42 weeks. In the event of a medical or other obstetrical complications, it is generally not recommended that the pregnancy be allowed to continue past 42 weeks. Examples of these medical and obstetrical complications are gestational hypertensive disorders, gestational diabetes, oligohydramnios, or a prior cesarean delivery. So in these cases of post-term pregnancies complicated by a medical condition, earlier delivery is indicated by labor induction. In managing post-term pregnancies, we have two options. First is labor induction, in which is the more popular option among OB gynecologists, and the second is expectant management with fetal surveillance. So first, let's talk about labor induction. Generally, there are two prognostic factors for a successful induction. 
First is the bishop's score of the cervix upon induction and the fetal station prior to induction. An unfavorable cervix is a cervix that is not dilated or closed and firm in consistency, which may be an ominous sign of a failure of labor induction and thus a high probability of a CS delivery. The favorability of the cervix for labor induction is quantified using the bishop scoring. So let us recall what is bishop scoring. This is a quantifiable method used to predict labor induction outcomes. And as you can see here, we have five elements in a bishop scoring system. So first we have cervical dilatation, cervical effacement, fetal station, cervical consistency, and the position of the cervix. So for example, if the cervix is closed, uneffaced, Station minus 3 is the fetal station, a firm consistency of the cervix, and the uh, position of the cervix is posterior, then that's a score or a bishop score of 0. A bishop score of 4 or less identifies an unfavorable cervix and which may be an indication for cervical ripening, while a bishop score of 9 conveys a high likelihood for a successful induction. So what do we do now if the bishop score is 4 or less? Do we still do labor induction knowing that it will most likely fail due to an unfavorable cervix? The answer to that question is we do cervical ripening. Cervical ripening is using pharmacological or mechanical agents to improve the bishop score of the cervix and make it more favorable for labor induction. These are some of the most commonly used regimens for cervical ripening prior to labor induction and the most common of which would be prostaglandin E2 in the form of dinoprostone gel or a dinoprostone insert or cervidil. Sweeping or stripping of the membranes is one of the procedures that we do in the clinics to induce labor and thereby prevent post-term pregnancy. So we do this in a term pregnant patient. We insert our two fingers the middle finger and the pointer finger and then insinuate these two fingers into the cervical canal and try to reach the chorionic membrane. So with our two fingers, we very gently try to separate the chorionic membrane from the decidua of the lower uterine segment like so. This membrane stripping at 38 to 40 weeks decreases the frequency of post-term pregnancy. And the act of stripping or separating the membranes from the decidua releases prostaglandins, which are chemicals that will induce contractions in the uterus, hence make spontaneous labor happen. Drawbacks of membrane stripping include pain, vaginal bleeding, and irregular contractions without labor. So the second prognostic factor is the station of the vertex or the presenting part. Sheen and colleagues studied 484 nuliparas who underwent induction after 41 weeks and they found out that cesarean rates are directly proportional to the station. So the higher the station, the higher the cesarean rates. So if the vertex or the presenting part was station minus 4, then there's a 77% chance that this patient will undergo cesarean section. So you notice that as the station becomes uh, lower, there, there is a corresponding lower cesarean rate. So the other management option for a post-term pregnancy that is aside from labor induction is expectant management with fetal surveillance. So how do we do that? First, we instruct the patient to do fetal movement counting each day. Second is to do non-stress testing or NST three times weekly. And the third is amniotic fluid volume assessment two to three times weekly with pockets that are less than three centimeters considered as abnormal. This is a good algorithm in the management of post-term pregnancy. So here, we start to do or initiate fetal surveillance starting at 41 completed weeks. If the patient reaches 42 completed weeks, 
If no complications, then you have two options. Either you do expectant management with fetal surveillance or labor induction. However, if there are medical or obstetrical complications accompanying post-term pregnancy, then you proceed to labor induction. How about intrapartum management of post-term pregnancy? Labor is a particularly dangerous time for the post-term fetus. Fetal heart rate and uterine contractions should be monitored electronically for tracings that are consistent with fetal compromise or fetal distress. Doing amniotomy is controversial. Further reduction in fluid volume can enhance the possibility of a cord compression, while on the other hand, amniotomy also aids in identification of a thick meconium, which may be dangerous to the fetus if aspirated. Identification of thick meconium in the amniotic fluid is very worrisome because aspiration of a thick meconium may cause severe pulmonary dysfunction and neonatal death. This is what I earlier said about meconium aspiration syndrome. We can do amnioinfusion during labor as a way of diluting meconium to decrease the incidence of aspiration syndrome. However, if the woman is remote from delivery, Strong consideration should be given to prompt cesarean section, especially when cephalopelvic dysproportion is suspected or either hypotonic or hypertonic dysfunctional labor is evident. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in this YouTube channel, Ina Erabon, and my WordPress site, Docina Obigaine. Thank you!